The February 9th meeting of the Senate Finance Committee will come to order. Senator Aaron May Quaid, welcome to the committee. We have only one bill, your bill, Senate File 70, which I believe has been to Health and Human Services and Judiciary on the way here. Welcome. We're going to focus primarily on the financial implication, but maybe you could go through the bill briefly first. Sure, and thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Good morning. Um, Mr. Chair, when you say go through the bill, would you like me to walk through it section by section or just give you a, an the overview? The concepts of it, I think people are familiar with most of it, but if you can just go through quickly anything you want to highlight. Absolutely. Um, good morning, members. Um, Senate File 70, the Reproductive Freedom Codification Act, uh, removes unconstitutional, outdated, and harmful laws from our books um, that have been passed over a number of years. In 1995, the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled that Minnesotans have the fundamental right to both have an abortion and decide to have an abortion without the government interfering or trying to sway them one way or the other. That 1995 Dovey Gomez case joined the 1976 Hodgson v. Lawson case and the 2002 or 2022, excuse me, Dovey Minnesota case. So uh, the Reproductive Freedom Codification Act includes abortion restrictions that were found unconstitutional. Um, specific parts of the um, outdated laws, fornication, sodomy, adultery, that have been found, unfound constitutional as well, conforming changes, and then it repeals um, some outdated and harmful language as well. Happy to address any specific parts of the bill, but that is the general gist. Thank you, and um, Mr. Nauman, in just a second. Would love to have you go through the fiscal note if you're available to do so. My apologies, Mr. Yes, Chair. No problem. I'm shuttling between a couple of items this morning. Um, so, Mr. Chair and members, um, the fiscal note identifies $194,000 of savings associated in the general fund. Um, most of that savings comes from uh, removed responsibilities, some staffing work um, associated with uh, work that was previously required that the bill repeals. There's a little bit of revenue um, associated with an interagency agreement between the health boards and uh, the Department of Health associated with um, some reporting provisions that were previously required um, associated with some of the abortion reporting um, that is no longer required. So um, the agency is booking an ongoing savings of 194. There's a little bit of um, revenue offset at the health in the health boards um, as well. That's the $15,000 that I mentioned earlier. So Mr. Chair, um, there are no appropriations reductions in the bill because the bases have not yet been set. So it would be, I mean, there's a decision for the legislature there, but it's my anticipation this would be sort of part of the ongoing fiscal effect that we would see later in uh, the Health and Human Services bill. Okay. Questions from the discussion? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Nauman, can you, can you kind of elaborate on that point about the fiscal note? I'm, I'm looking specifically at page two where the LBO says uh, the proposed legislation has a fiscal impact to DHS and while they claim uh, an accurate fiscal impact cannot be determined, the LBO also mentions that the relevant data that they need can be found in a report that's already released. So Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, um, I think maybe the page to look at would be page eight. This is what we call a consolidated fiscal note. Mm -hmm. So each agency com completes its portion. And you're certainly correct in identifying that there are potential expenditures that the, um, the agency has identified. And you'll notice that they click that box in the upper right-hand corner, which an agency does um, when they're, for expenditures, when they believe that there is, in fact, a potential expenditure. Um, and then you, you highlighted the assumption language on page nine, and I'll just read it so that it, everyone knows what we're talking about. DHS assumes an increase in utilization for abor abortion services may occur in MA and Minnesota care due to a change in the definition of medical necessity. However, the department is unable to quantify these impacts due to a lack of available data. I can let the, the agency, if they're here, speak to this in detail, um, but it's my understanding that the agency was uncomfortable um, ascribing whether there would be a cost to MA 
or Minnesota Care, simply due to the fact that there is this change in medical death uh, of medical necessity. I'm sure the author can speak in more detail about what that change actually is, but it's my understanding that um, it is a potential that an individual doctor may not determine that a particular abortion service was in fact a medical necessity, um, and which which could theoretically generate a public cost. Sure. Brad or Thank you, Mr. Chair. But I'd also note on page two of the fiscal note, uh, last paragraph, basically last sentence, the LBO does re recognize that relevant data can be found in a report released by the Minnesota Department of Health, and he lists the uh, and he lists the uh, uh, the link as well. So it it seems as though that that data is relevant and is available, and yet not a part of this fiscal note is. Is that a fair read of, of the LBO's comment, Mr. Nauman? Mr. Chair and Senator Pratt, I think it is, based on the plain reading of what the LBO has written, a fair reading. Um, I know that the LBO uh, went back and forth with the agency on what to record in this particular fiscal note. Mr. Chair? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that uh, Senate File 70 be laid on the table until we can get a, an accurate and complete fiscal note. Um, is that a debatable motion? Is it or not? This is not a debatable okay, not motion. Not a debatable motion. A motion to lay this bill on the table. Roll call. roll call has been requested. Um, staff will take the roll. Chair Marnie? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? No. Senator Dames? Yes. Senator Drehan? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Aye. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Pappas? No. Senator Westrom? Senator Wickland? Being four no's and five, uh, five Four yeas and five nays. The motion does not prevail. Senator Mayquay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, I will um, have you look to page two, to the d paragraph that you're discussing. Um, the, the important sentence here is the relevant data can be found in the report released by the Department of Health. What they're referring to here is uh, reporting that is done by the Department of Health. They collect extensive data, um, or I should say providers collect extensive data on people who have abortions in Minnesota. The particular piece that's relevant there is it talks about people who pay through public insurance, private insurance, or self-pay. And so that data is relevant to this fiscal note. In theory, um, every person who self-pays for their abortion could potentially have public insurance. Um, they don't. but if you wanted to go down that route, even if every single person who self-paid for their abortions in 2021, 2020, 2019, 2018, 2017, as far back as I could tell, it still would not cost more than this fiscal note saves based on the reimbursement rate from the state. Further discussion? Well, thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. And clearly the LBO believes that um, the Legislative Budget Office clearly believes that that relevant data could be used to estimate the cost. Uh, they provide the link. Uh, we certainly have been able to identify cost savings. They admit that there's going to be an increased expenditure, but fail to use their own data to, to generate that. And I'm disappointed that the majority uh, has decided uh, yet again, like with Senate File 1, to ignore increased cost as it, as it goes through the Finance Committee uh, on, a, on a bill that has such widespread impact. Uh, to all of us um, and to the taxpayer, quite honestly, because I believe that, that the bill does more than just bring us into compliance with either Doe v. Gomez or with Doe v. Minnesota that was decided last year. Um, the Department of Health says there's going to be uh, increased expenditures. As Senator Murphy said, they have extensive data. Uh, we've seen in fiscal notes and bills from agencies uh, on numerous occasions that they draw assumptions on what those uh, expenditures might be. And yet here we have 
the, the department has even failed, failed to attempt to try to put any sort of assumptions on it. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm, again, I, I guess I'm, I'm disappointed that the majority is trying to ram this bill through without a complete fiscal note, without, without complete transparency to the people of Minnesota that there will be an increased cost. Senator May Quaid. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt, I, I think it's really important to note that in order for the department to estimate this, they would have to guess how many people in Minnesota would become pregnant, how many of those would have abortions, of those people, what kind of insurance they have, how much money they make, and therefore how much they might be able to pay themselves, whether their private insurance covers it. it it's unestimatable. However, um, Currently, in the state of Minnesota, medical assistance does cover abortion care services. And so, you know, people are able to access abortion services through MA, and they're and so I think the, the department is recognizing that this is already something that happens in the state of Minnesota. And so the the cost, as as Mr. Nauman said, there could be specific doctors who might have denied abortion care coverage under this before that won't now, but it's uh, it, it'd be impossible to estimate. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, having been on HHS for, for a number of years and being Vice Chair, there was always a fiscal note on every bill that came through that. So I'm a little disappointed in the agency uh, on that. And on that, as far as the data goes, um, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about um, minority pregnancies and, and all the issues and all the data that we track in that realm. So why wouldn't we continue tracking that, um, you know, for women's health in, in the case of abortion, I, I guess would be my question. Senator Mayfleet. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dreheim. Um, when we track uh, black maternal mortality and morbidity or indigenous mortality and morbidity, those are statistics based on people who are pregnant and then their outcomes. Um, when, I, you know, when we're talking about people who might have abortions, we'd have to guess who would become pregnant and then what they decide to do with that pregnancy, which is a totally different set of um, statistics and analysis. And I can let the department talk a little bit more about that. Could, could I follow up real quick on that sure, before that maybe he can respond? There are cases of a, a botched abortion too, and wouldn't we want to track that also? <clears throat> Mr. Burdick or Senator McQueen? Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Dreamheim, um, I think you're talking about medication abortion, which in rare cases isn't a complete termination, in which case they might have an in-clinic abortion. Um, but they're not botched. They're just incomplete. And some people decide to continue their pregnancy and some people don't. There's no harm to the person who's pregnant. And I don't know if the state itself needs to publish that data, but they certainly can track that data through the normal processes that we use to track other public health data. But you're uh, eliminating it in this bill. How could we track it if we're eliminating the reporting? Mr. Chair and Senator Draheim, um, nothing about Senate File 70 removes the ability for public health researchers to continue to track data the way that they do for all other things. Who has heart attacks, maternal mortality, morbidity, the outcomes of people with cancer, so on and so forth. This just uh, removes the requirement for the state to collect and publish that data under felony penalties and misdemeanor penalties for providers. Mr. Burdick, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Matt Burdick, Director of State Government Relations with the Department of Human Services. And um, as Senator McQuaid explained, in our fiscal note, this is something that you will see occasionally where we recognize that there could potentially be a fiscal impact, but we don't have the underlying data to support quantifying that in a way that would meet our budgeting rules. In this case, as the Senator outlined, we would essentially be predicting future behavior that we don't have any understanding of. The report that's referenced talks about abortion services that have been provided and then breaks that down by insurance coverage. So we do know today how many abortions have been paid for under medical assistance. What we don't know is how to quantify how many people may have not otherwise been able to access it under currently or would be in the future under this bill. And so that's why you see that effectuated in the way in the fiscal note. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, um, Senator McQuaid. Uh, I wanted to follow up on um, the question from Senator Dreheim. We have a long history in America and in Minnesota about uh, outcomes 
uh, and outcomes and race when it comes to all sorts of measures, including health and health disparities. As I understand uh, the language of data collection um, that would be repealed in your bill, uh, it is one slice of data. But from my understanding of where we are and the work that is being done on black uh, mortality and morbidity, it doesn't draw a picture of all of the drivers that lead to disparate outcomes. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, from your perspective, based on the work that you've been doing on this piece of legislation, if the data that we need to understand, the mortality and morbidity of uh, black maternal health, um, is rooted in the data that would be uh, repealed in this legislation, or if there are other sources, better sources of data that will predict and help policymakers make decisions to improve the disparate outcomes for black women uh, in their pregnancies and birth. Um, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> Senator Murphy, I appreciate the question. So I think it's really important to understand that the drivers around black maternal mortality and morbidity, indigenous mortality and morbidity, um, are rooted in many different things. Uh, systemic racism in the healthcare system, um, you know, systemic racism in how much we earn and where we live, environmental racism on the things that impact us. Um, there has been extensive documentation and studies that prove that the experience of racism itself um, causes, is part of the maternal mortality and morbidity outcomes for black and indigenous uh, parents. And so what we have in Senate File 70 that's being repealed is actually just what we would call data surveillance. It's information that providers are required to capture from patients under threat of felony and misdemeanor penalties that the state then reports out in a public report that no one does anything with except um, you know, point to you know, how many people have had abortions or how much they might have cost. When we use public health research for purposes of solving crises, there is an, a real process that we do that through. It happens in partnership with um, medical institutions and with um, medical boards and with organizations dedicated to ending whatever the health outcome might be. And there is a process for collecting that data and then utilizing that data with policymakers like ourselves to make legislative changes. Nothing in the reporting from the state has um, ever been used by this legislature to solve any um, you know, health outcome for better or for worse. Um, it has only been used to say how many abortions happen in the state of Minnesota, who's having those kinds of abortions, but it also collects things like how many miscarriages a person's had, their educational attainment, things that are highly irrelevant to someone's health care and the health care that they're receiving um, in clinics. So um, this does not, um, it has not solved any problems. It has not um, helped with any problems, but there are lots of things we can do that live outside of Senate File 70 to solve those problems. And one of them, I, well, part of it would be repealing some of these uh, confusing laws that prevent people from accessing the pregnancy care that they need when they need it. Senator Graham. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Senator, for bringing this bill forward. And for the discussion, you know, on, on 2.13, you strike the collection under section 145.413. Um, and when I read that, it says death of a woman. If any woman who has had an abortion dies from any cause within 30 days of an abortion, and it goes on and on and on, that's the reporting you're removing. I, why wouldn't we want to know that? I mean... Mr. Chair, Senator Draheim, um, so part of what you just read out, it, why it's um, highly irrelevant data, is it says if a person dies from an abor from any cause within 30 days of abortion, so if I'd had an abortion today and then died in a car accident tomorrow, somehow the doctor who provided me the abortion care would have to then know that and provide that data to the state. Um, so it is, we're asking doctors to do something that, that is impossible to do because um, abortion is literally one of the safest medical procedures that exists. I think there have been 13 people who've died among um, like 130 million in the last 20 years. Um, so it is like 0.000001% of people have complications so bad and it's usually because of the pregnancy complications that led them to having the abortion in the first place. Um, and so the reason why we're striking that is not because if 
that was a thing that was important to the state, we can still collect that data and we can still monitor um, how health outcomes for people who have abortions. We can and do. Um, what this is striking is the felony penalties for not reporting this data to the state and not requiring the state to publish it in a report each year on July 1st. Uh, Senator Jayhan. Can we just modify and, and delete subsection three then, which is the penalty part, and still have the reporting? If, if that's the problem with this section, let's just take out the penalty and leave the reporting in. Mr. Chair, Senator Draheim, the reporting itself is problematic because it creates a barrier and, and all of these laws work together in a scheme to limit access to people who need abortions. And so part of the way that this law works is yes, the felony penalties, but it requires um, providers to maintain a separate database to report it to the state, which can be expensive and onerous. And then it also um, you know, breaks down trust between patients and providers because there's, there's no medical reason for a provider to ask, how much money do you make before you have an abortion? And so it creates this um, surveillance of people who have abortions that's highly unnecessary. And as we move into the post row America and people are seeking to criminalize and jail people who have abortions or who, who provide abortions, it's highly concerning that the state conducts this kind of surveillance, not for any health purposes, but just to publish the report. And so we can still collect data for public health reasons, but it doesn't need to be done by statute like this. We can just collect it all the other ways. Senator J. Hamm, Thank you, Chair, and, and thanks for your patience. Um, you know, you just said that it was a very rare occurrence that this would take fact, but I think as we're increasing the number of abortions, one would assume that there might be more complications. Statistically, probably not as relevant, but it would be nice to know for us policymakers and, and track that. So it, I, I still would like to uh, maybe just offer an oral amendment um, that we, we leave in the first part of 145.413 and delete the penalty if that's the main concern, because we use information all the time on health and human service. Um, I, I, I think it's pertinent information, um, so I, I, I don't know if an amendment could be could be drafted to do that. Senate Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I believe the um, amendment would be on page one, delete section one, and on page sixteen, line sixteen, delete subdivisions two and and insert the word subdivision, and that has the effect of leaving subdivision two in place and repealing subdivision three, which is the penalty. Uh, Mr. Chair um, and members, I would ask for an, a no vote on this. Um, I'll tell you that right now in the United States, um, there are health complications from a number of things that happen, um, including in the state of Minnesota. Medication abortion is safer than over-the-counter Tylenol, safer than Viagra, um, abortion in general, safer than having a tooth extracted or having a colonoscopy. We do not collect data and publish it in this way for any of those health care procedures, but we do uh, collect data on health outcomes. And so what this bill, Senate File 70, would do is restore the way we collect data on abortion care to the same way we collect public health data on everything else. And so I would ask for a no vote because this piece is just unnecessary in law and creates barriers and harms patients. Further discussion on the Drayheim Amendment. Yeah. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and just, I, I, first of all, I support the Drayheim Amendment. I think it makes a lot of sense uh, to make sure that we know the outcomes and the safety of these procedures. But, uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to to make sure we have some some parameters around the debate. Uh, Senator May Quaid said, you know, we shouldn't be jailing women who have abortions or their providers, and I don't believe anybody's been jailed, and nor have we ever suggested that women be jailed for uh, getting an abortion. I find that extremely inflammatory, and I would ho hope the chair will make sure that we have a civil and, and relevant debate today. Um, I. I've been listening to the debate. I don't think she was saying anything that that we're not hearing regularly about concerns from medical providers about being jailed. Um, Mr. So Chair, I, we have never, never proposed that a woman be jailed for getting an abortion, and, and I found that comment by Senator Maquade extremely uh, offensive. And and that's what that's the part that I'm talking about, making sure that that we have. But I don't believe we've ever jailed a provider for failing to do any of these 
it, it does list it as a penalty, penalty or a felony, but I don't believe we've ever jailed. But I'm more, I'm more concerned about uh, the hyperbole of, of suggesting that those who oppose this bill are, are somehow wanting to put women who get an abortion in jail. That is patently false. It's incorrect. And uh, I would ask the chair to make sure that we have a relevant and civil discussion on this bill. Senator Pratt, I think we've been having a relevant and civil discussion on the bill and we'll proceed with. Is there further discussion on the Dreheim Amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The chair's belief is the motion does not prevail. And I want to report quickly, I counted wrong on the previous roll call. There were four ayes and six nays, not five. So I'll let the record reflect that. Further discussion on the bill? Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I have the A13 amendment. Senator Dames offers A13 amendment. While it's being distributed, you can go ahead and explain it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The A13 amendment deletes section eight on page nine, so we revert back to the current statutes when it comes to dealing with Minnesota care and medical necessity definition. And on page 11, it repeals section 10. Uh, it repeals the new language that would allow taxpayers to pay for more abortions. That would be the extent of what A the A13 amendment does, and I would encourage a supporting vote on this. Senator May Quaid on the A13 amendment. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames. Members, I'm going to encourage a no vote. This has been um, decided by the Minnesota Supreme Court. They're very clear that the Minnesota legislature cannot put its thumb on the scale in favor of one pregnancy outcome or another, and further, they cannot coerce people into having uh, to giving birth um, through legislative monetary measures. And so preventing um, people from accessing abortion care through monetary measures is that kind of coercion. And so this was the exact uh, case that was before the Supreme Court in 1995. They've already ruled and they've said it is unconstitutional. And so I'll ask for a no vote. Further discussion on the A13 amendment. Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I'm just going to see if I can find my reference here. But I would, uh, I would remind uh, this this uh, uh, committee that when we look at Dovi Gomez, uh, Judge Stringer specifically said, specifically we hold the state cannot refuse to provide abortions to MA and GAMAC eligible women when the procedure is necessary for therapeutic reasons. And what the bill does is effectively strike what's been the longstanding practice. Um, in fact, just this month, and, and Mr. Chair, I have a, uh, uh, a copy of the form that, is, that was just recently uh, updated by the Minnesota Department of Health, it does in fact say, uh, make sure that uh, there, there is a medical necessity statement um, to ensure that uh, these are, are therapeutic abortions. What Senator McQuaid's bill does is go well beyond Doe v. Gomez or Doe v. Minnesota um, in, this, in this case. And given that there is a fiscal impact, as determined by the, the, the Department of Health, I think we should strip this section out, have it come back as a separate bill with a relevant cost. And, and I have more to say on that, I can, but um, I do think there are a number of concerns specifically with these sections. And, uh, I respectfully disagree with my colleague on what Dovi Gomez says because I'm reading it straight from the from the uh, from the court finding. Senator McQuaid. Um Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Pratt. So, I'll, if you're if you're holding the uh, Dovi Gomez decision in front of you, there's a few other sections I would point you to. One is that um, they further found that Minnesotans have the fundamental right to have an abortion and decide to have an abortion without the government interfering or trying to sway them one way or the other. It's rooted in our right to privacy, found in the penumbras of the Minnesota Constitutions, I believe 1, 2, 7, and 10. Um, and so therapeutic in this case has been um, broadly understood to mean for reasons necessitated by the patient and not specific to you know, only in this case, only in this case. So therapeutic in this case could mean because somebody has decided to have an abortion. 
Further discussion of the Dames A13 amendment? Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. I think that's uh, uh, very interesting, the determination of what therapeutic means. Uh, unfortunately, and I'm going to say it the way I see it, it's starting to appear as these abortion bills are moving through that we kind of use what we want to use and we kind of describe what things are in the way we want them to be and maybe they aren't and I think that's unfortunate but I would really encourage uh, the, member, the members to support this bill. There's several reasons for it. Uh, Senator Pratt laid out some very good reasons but uh, this bill could come back, this piece could come back as a separate bill uh, but uh, I would encourage a green vote on this and I'd ask for a roll call. Senator Dames requests a roll call um, on the amendment. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I would also remind the committee that in the Dovi Gomez case, it states that both parties agree women have a fundamental right to obtain an abortion before fetal viability under, under the Minnesota and United States constitutions. So there is a threshold in Dovi Gomez that is, is uh, that we're using as a um, is a reason for doing this when it's, it specifically states in the, in the case that, that that's not uh, exactly true. Uh, but Mr. Chair, I have a, a, a question. I'm sorry, I missed your name uh, from the Department of Health before. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Matt Burdick with the department. Burke? Matt Burdick. Burkett, thank you, uh, Mr. Burkett. Uh, Mr. Burkett, do we uh, receive federal funds for uh, MA and, and uh, Minnesota Care? Um, Mr. Chair, Senator, uh, yes, both programs are state and federal funds. However, um, for some services, we as a state have decided to use state funding. Abortion services is one of those services where, depending on the circumstance, we may receive federal matching funds, and in other cases, um, we pay with all state funds as uh, the legislature and the courts have ruled we must. So, m Mr. Chair, Senator Mr. Burkett, um, wouldn't those funds be subject to the Hyde Amendment, which would prevent taxpayer money being used to fund elective abortions? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, yes, as I was explaining, we are um, careful and part of the reason that we have to, as in the bill language, understand to identify when we are able to um, claim federal funds because there are circumstances under which we can and when we cannot. And so that's important for uh, the department on kind of an accounting basis that we make sure that we're not claiming federal funds when that's not appropriate. Mr. Chair, may I get a page, please? A page? page. And I would like to, uh, I would like to have this handed out to the committee members as well as Mr. Burkett, maybe Mr. Burkett first, so we can have a discussion. Mr. Burkett, I'm handing out a, a, a form, DHS2327-ENG, which I understand is dated uh, uh, was re last revised January of 23, where we go through and uh, state physical information about why an abortion is being uh, performed. And in all cases, there seem to be some sort of restrictions on them. Can you help me understand um, what elective abortions are being done with taxpayer money when state statute specifically prevents it and the Hyde Amendment specifically prevents it and it appears your own uh, DHS 2327.ENG two, uh, two, form prevents it. Senator, Mr. Burgett. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, um, as we've been discussing, this form is intended to identify what the reason uh, for the service is, and that helps to inform how we determine when federal funding is, can be claimed and when it cannot. And so as um, Senator McWade talked about, this fourth piece, um, other health or therapeutic reasons, is a valid reason for which we would cover abortion services that is done with all state dollars. Senator Pratt. Thank you. So, Mr. Burkett, we're, we're stating that all, all taxpayer, taxpayer funded abortions are being done for therapeutic reasons. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, no, that's um, not exactly what this form says. It does delineate four different circumstances in which abortion can be performed. That is one of the four circumstances, and that's about determining what um, funding the service is eligible to receive, state and federal. Further discussion on the, oh, Senator Pratt. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm specifically looking at item four, right? And it says, can you, I, I guess, you know, as I look at it, right, number one, um, they suffer from a physical disorder, physical injury, physical illness, including life endangering um, a condition caused by or arising from the pregnancy uh, as certified by a physician. Uh, pregnancy resulted from rape, pregnancy resulted from incest, abortion is being done for other health and therapeutic reasons. Mr. Burkett, it seems pretty clear what the, de what the department is currently doing, correct? Mr. Burdick. Mr. Chair, Senator, yes, this does delineate the four uh, medical necessity criteria currently that we utilize to determine when an abortion can be paid for with um, public program funds. Mr. Chair. Senator Brett. Continue. Thank you. So, Mr. Burkett, I'm just, I'm curious as, as far as when, when Dovey Gomez says that it needs to be for therapeutic purposes, it also says that uh, all parties agree that, you know, they, they have a right to abortion before fetal viability. Um, and this goes back to the fiscal note in many ways because what you've said is that we are not codifying current practice or current law or current case law, but this is an expansion of law that would cause an increase in expenditure that, you, that your department has failed to estimate. Mr. Chair, Senator, um, excuse me, <clears throat> what the fiscal note articulates is that we are no longer requiring doctors to attest to this fourth uh, component here, and that in theory, there, as the fiscal note articulates, there could be people that are able to access abortion services because these um, kind of bureaucratic steps are no longer in place. Senator Brett. Thank you, Mr. Burkett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Burkett. So, Yes, as your fiscal note says, there will be a, a cost. There will be additional expenditures. You were, you were very uh, uh, kind to provide the, uh, uh, the cost savings, but uh, you know, I, I look back, Mr. Chair, at uh, House File 4 that Senator Muhammad is carrying, and we have agencies all the time estimate what the impact's going to be. If I look at Senator Muhammad's fiscal note, it assumes that there are 81,000 individuals in Minnesota without legal immigration status. Of those, uh, 70, of, it assumes 77,000 are eligible for an ID. Approximately 20% or 15,000 would apply for a non-compliant driver's license. The pass rate... Senator Pratt, I, I Mr. urge you not to get a long detail into a fiscal note that's not before the Mr. Committee. Chair, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that we make these assumptions all the time based on the data that we have, and the Department of Health has failed to do that at a very basic level. We have DVS going through and very, and very making very specific assumptions along the way, and yet we can't get that, those same assumptions on this particular fiscal note. Senator Pratt, the Health Department found savings in this bill. DHS did not find savings or cost in the bill. Mr. Chair, the, the, the fiscal note specifically says that there are expenditures from the Department of Health. Mr. Chair. Senator Champion, with all due respect, I thought we were on a certain amendment, and it seems like we're now far afoot and talking about a fiscal note that, that perhaps could be talked about some other time, but right now we're supposed to be on the amendment and I don't quite see yes. how the line of discussion that is going on right now is really about the amendment that is before the body. So I, I'm not suggesting that, you know, Senator Pratt can't ask those questions at some other time, but there is a motion before the body. Mr. Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The majority is, is really being non-transparent with the current fiscal note. And what Senator Dames, one of the, as I understand it, and the, and the point that I'm arguing, is Senator Dames' amendment is striking those pieces that specifically have, have been identified by the Department of Health as an increased cost and suggesting those become a separate bill. And I think that's wholly relevant to the discussion that we have here. Now, Senator Champion, I know you've been trying to silence the voice of the minority in this committee over and over, and there is no germaneness on the in the committee process, but 
I will say that Mr. the fiscal note is a relevant part of Senator Dames' amendment Chair. and Senator Dames' argument. Uh, Mayor Champion. Senator Pratt, I, I would hope, you know, you and I have a really good relationship, but I think you're going far afoot now to make an accusation as to what I'm trying to do is beyond the pale. And I would hope that you would apologize for that comment because I just asked about what issue that we're on. And I'm, I'm waiting for an apology. Mr. Chair? Senator Pratt. It was, Mr. Chair, it was not my intention to offend my colleague. I'm just stating that it seems like every time we have a hearing, um, there's a, uh, an, an attempt to limit the conversation and uh, everything that I was talking about regarding the fiscal note isn't, is wholly relevant to Senator Dames's amendment because the parts that we're taking out speak specifically to the parts that are in the amendment. And so Senator Champion, I'm sorry that I offended you, but I think there has been an attempt by multiple members of this committee uh, to try to limit the discussion by the minority party. And uh, by claiming that my argument was not germane to the discussion or not germane to the amendment, I think overlooks the Senator fact Pratt, that Senator been, Dames... Senator Pratt, excuse me for a second. I've been letting you continue. I'm, Thank you. Go on. You don't have to spend the time explaining why you should be allowed to explain. Just explain it. That would be... Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, again, the, the relevant parts that Senator Dames is asking be, be struck from this go wholly to the fiscal note. And I would ask the majority to please be uh, consistent and transparent with the people of Minnesota because we have an example, as I cited, in another bill where these assumptions can be estimated and can be put together. And the, and the Department of Health, even, even by the LBO standards, said the relevant data does exist for them to do these assumptions. Now, you refuse to lay the bill on the table, and so I think it's, it's, the argument is that these amendments, this amendment should be adopted because it has a fiscal cost that has not been documented. And, it, and I think there is some confusion around uh, what Mr. Burkett is saying is that, well, sometimes we pay for it with federal funds, sometimes we don't, when their own form lays out that everything that is being performed is being performed under Minnesota Care. So we're not denying that, as, as Senator May Quaid said, that the Constitution has found that women have that right. We, I interpret it differently than Senator May Quaid does. Um, but even under Doe v, uh, Doe v. Minnesota, the judge did not rule that, um, that sections 8 and 10 were unconstitutional. M Mr. Chair. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator Pratt, I think it's really important to, to broaden maybe your what the parameters you're thinking of in terms of cost. When Minnesota Care or MA pays for pregnancy care, they do so regardless of what the outcome is, right? So if somebody gets pregnant and stays pregnant, they will pay for labor and delivery, pregnancy care, or if someone decides to have an abortion, they'll pay for an abortion. So part of what makes it impossible for a department to estimate this is one. So using Senator Muhammad's bill, for example, we know how many undocumented people there are in the Minnesota. We don't know how many people can get pregnant are in Minnesota. We know people who Mr. might have Chair? uteruses and might be of an age, but we don't Point know if they can be pregnant. Two, we don't know if people are going to continue to stay pregnant or have abortions, and there would be a cost differential if someone continued a pregnancy versus having an abortion. But that would be impossible. It would be impossible to know that. And then is it multiples, and is it a complicated pregnancy, is it geriatric pregnancy, so on and so forth. And so that is why they're unable to do that. What they're, they're not saying the relevant data that we could use to estimate that is found here. They're pointing you to how people have paid for abortions in Minnesota in the past, if you'd like to see that, which is the best data that they can give you on how people pay for abortions in Minnesota. Senator Pratt. Well, Senator, Mr. Chair, uh, the, the point of order was going to be, I was, uh, I was interrupted by referencing Senator Muhammad's bill as a reason why the Department of Health could estimate this cost, and Senator McQuaid uh, was allowed to freely reference Senator Muhammad's bill 
as a reason why <laughs> we shouldn't. And so I would just ask the chair to please be consistent because I feel like there's a different standard being applied to the minority than the majority in this case. Mr. Senator Pratt, on that point, you were going on, you were reading details out of this fiscal note on a bill. She made one sentence reference to that same fiscal note. That's all I was saying. I, I saw you make the point of order. I was guessing that's what you might be thinking, but you had raised this whole thing for probably two minutes before I said something about the other fiscal note. And, um, and she said one sentence. So, but continue on the debate. I'm well, sorry, I'm not you. trying to cut off that. I'm trying to make sure we have well, full and fair debate on and it. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And the reason I was reading the fiscal note was because there are very detailed assumptions that are, that, that are not necessarily currently reported, but that they have to make estimates on. And it clearly states in the fiscal note that there will be expenditures. Um, and I'm trying to find... It says uh, Section 8 would, would modify uh, medical assistance coverage and Section 10 would eliminate language restricting Minnesota care coverage for abortion services to cases where the life of the female would be endangered in parents as specified or pregnancy as a result. Assumptions. The bill is assumed to be effective. Um, DHS assumes an increase in utilization for abortion services may occur under MA in Minnesota care due to the change in definition of medical necessity. So, Mr. Chair, my point of referencing Senator Muhammad's bill was to say, in some cases, the departments can do these estimates. And in this case, the Department of Health chose not to do those estimates. And it has a direct impact to the fiscal note that's before this, before this body, which is under the jurisdiction of this committee. And Senator Dame's amendment is trying to strip that out so that the bill has the same cost that the fiscal note would imply. It carries all the cost savings that Senator, uh, Senator May Quaid has indicated and strips out the very portion that the Department of Health has assumed would, would result in increased costs but has failed to document or, or make any sort of estimation on. Again, I'm disappointed that the motion to lay on the table was uh, was voted down by the majority on a party line vote. Um, and so I think we have to do it through Senator Dames' amendment to make sure that we can come back and have this, this, this full discussion about what the impact of the state's going to be. Further discussion, Senator Draheim, on the A13 amendment. Senator just, Draheim. Thank you, Chair. And, uh, you know, I just Googled on uh, Minnesota Department of Health website on uh, fertility rates. So you could take what they do on the website is 15 to 44 year olds, how many, 58.4 births per thousand. I get that is not on pregnancies, but we could take um, a percentage of the population and come up with a good target on an increase based on future projections of population in the next biennium um, to come up with a number. So I, I, I find it, we have stats for everything and I, 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 I don't really buy the, the notion that it would be impossible to come up with a number. We, they do it every day on a million fiscal notes, um, or 3,000 this year. So I, I uh, would encourage a green vote on the amendment. I know we don't have the votes to pass it, um, but I just want to clarify that the Department of Health does track statistics. Our demographer tra tracks statistics. Um, we, we could uh, have a rational, simple formula to calculate that. Thank you. Further discussion on the Dames A13 amendment. I think you asked for a roll call, Senator Dames. Yes, I did. Thank you, sir. Uh, staff will take the roll. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Senator Marty? No. Senator Friends? No. Senator Pratt? Yes. Senator Champion? No. Senator Dames? Yes. Senator Drayheim? Yes. Senator Eichhorn? Yes. Senator Mohammed? No. Senator Murphy? Nope. Senator Pappas? Yes. Senator Westrom? Yes. Senator Wickland?
There being five ayes and six nays, the motion does not prevail. Further discussion on the bill? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm, I'm disappointed um, in the direction of this committee. It's, it's clear that this is going to be uh, rammed through without any transparency for the people of Minnesota to see. Uh, but, Mr. Chair, I would request a roll call with the, uh, with the outcome being printed in the journal. Senator Pratt requests that there be a roll call on the bill and it be pressed in the journal. Is there further discussion on the bill? Senator Pratt. No, three okay, hands. three hands. Uh, there are three hands. Okay. Uh, be printed in the journal. Um, is there further discussion? If not, on the um, motion of Senator Murphy that Senate File 70 be recommended pass. Um, all those, let's see, the Secretary will take the roll. Thank you, Chair. Senator Marty? No. Uh, yes. Senator Friends? Yes. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Champion? Yes. Senator Dames? No. Senator Dreheim? No. Senator Eichhorn? No. Senator Mohammed? Yes. Senator Murphy? Yes. Senator Pappas? Yes. Senator Westrom? No. There being six ayes and five nays, the motion prevails and the bill is recommended passed. There being no further bills up on today's agenda, we do not know next week's agenda, which is what I'm assuming you're asking about. We will let you know as soon as we do know. That, that was what you were asking about. Good. I was planning to announce that, but thank you for asking. Senator Pappas. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, we would appreciate a heads up about at least what days we'll be meeting, you know, so, you know, we can schedule meetings um, right. if we're not meeting in I the morning. Hear you. And I don't know that we'll be meeting all three days next week, but I will let you know as soon as we Great. can. I hope later today even. Great. Thank you. With that, this meeting is adjourned.